Welcome to the Airline Weekly Lounge. I'm your host, Edward Russell, and this week I'm joined by my colleague Jay Shabat to discuss the view in Latin America from the Alta Leaders Forum in Buenos Aires and American Airlines and United Airlines third quarter results. Enjoy. Hey, Jay, how are you doing today? Good morning, Ned. It is a nice autumn morning here on the East Coast. It's uh, definitely cooled off. Uh, I was down in Argentina for the annual Alta Leaders Forum earlier this week, so it was a bit of a change of weather when I got back. That's right. It's uh, getting into summer down there, right? That's right. That's right. Though they they say it's still a cold spring, but um, it was warm by my accounts. Anyway, that's not why I was there to enjoy the weather. I was there to learn more about what is happening in Latin America, and the Alta Leaders Forum is a great place because. Pretty much all of the major airline CEOs from the region attend. Yeah, I'm sure uh, that you've got a lot of great information that, uh, yeah, and I'm sure we'll be able to share that in this week's issue. Uh, and um, we're going to talk about a little bit here. Uh, so, yeah, Ned, maybe some some key takeaways, uh, Any anything that stand at, stands out um, as, uh, I don't know, a big surprise for you or something interesting that you learned at the event? Yeah, so the headline story is travel demand in Latin America, as in most of the world, remains very strong, despite the macroeconomic headwinds. But what stood out to me is the CEOs I spoke to now, this is uh, Roberto Alvo at LATAM, Adrian Neuhauser at Avianca, Celso Fer at Gol, I mean, down the, down the list, you know, they all are more cautious than especially what we're hearing in the U.S. Now, I went after listening to Delta Airlines last week and, and Ed Bastian at Delta called travel counter cyclical. But when I went down to, to Argentina, the CEOs there are not willing to go that far. They say demand is robust through the holidays, but they're very, very aware of, of the, the economic situation. And for the record, it doesn't make it isn't a huge surprise that they're hesitant because, you know, foreign airlines, they have a lot of expenses in U.S. dollars, for example, fuel, maintenance, aircraft, and the U.S. dollar is very strong. So when that is good for Delta, that's not necessarily good for LATAM or Avianca or Gol or Azul. So it was definitely a more pessimistic outlook, even though the current trend is still very strong. Interesting. Yeah, no, and it, it does seem like the... Uh... The U.S. airlines are shielded from that foreign exchange exposure, which is a big deal right now because of the, you know, what's happening with the dollar. Now, I should um, one thing that I, th- I think it is uh, worth pointing out here is that, uh, and I noticed this this morning because I was looking at the Euro Mexico results, and the uh, the Mexican peso, as well as I believe the Brazilian real, I'm checking that as we speak here. Um, those are two rare currencies that have actually showed a bit of uh, appreciation against the dollar. It's actually gotten a little bit stronger. Now, to be perfectly clear, those currencies are down versus where they were a year ago, two years ago. So it's still very much an issue. Um, the Absolutely. real in particular, yeah, um, the, the real in particular is, you know, right now is trading at what is it about 5.27? That's kind of the average for October. 5.27 to the dollar. Um, I mean, if you go back to, let's see, 2019 at this time, it was more like four to the dollar. So it's, you know, you're only getting, you know, four, four uh, um, to, to the dollar. So it's, yeah, you, you can see that it's, depreciation is still very much an issue. But but again, yeah, worth noting that uh, you haven't seen the uh, the recent kind of degradation as you've seen in some, in most currencies around the world. Right, right. And Azul CEO John uh, Rogerson, he pointed out that at its worst, the, the Reyes had depreciated as much as 40% against the dollar, though it, it I, I saw this too, I didn't realize it was up, but it's definitely uh, rebounded a good deal in recent months. But the other side of the picture that, that people were talking about is, is consolidation. So we know that Avianca and Gol are forming the Abra Group, which would also eventually include Viva Air in Colombia and potentially Sky Airline in Chile. So, you know, I spoke to a lot of people about consolidation and the interesting, well, maybe not so interesting, is that everyone involved in consolidation is very gung-ho about it, but those that are not involved in consolidation were were much more like, oh, it's it might not work, et cetera, et cetera. 
Uh, John Rogerson uh, at Azul went as far to say that, you know, domestic consolidation makes a lot of sense, but he's very skeptical of cross-border, which of course ABRA will be. It'll be a multi-country group. Uh, the caveat there is Azul did attempt a hostile takeover of LATAM during uh, LATAM's Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Uh, Azul failed, so they're a bit of the spurned lover there. So it's it, that was not terribly surprising, but it does leave a question mark for exactly how much consolidation will, will lift the industry in South America. Right. And, and John Rogerson is actually going to, I believe, uh, speak at uh, the Skift Aviation Forum next month. And it'll be interesting. I mean, that's that's certainly uh, something that I'm sure will come up is, you know, there was that, uh, as you alluded to, Ned, Azul tried to, uh, you know, they were interested in buying LATAM's Brazilian network and didn't really go anywhere. Um, but clearly they they see the potential for consolidation to help their margins. And it's it's really, you know, it, it's no secret as to why that's the case. I mean, if you look in just before the pandemic in 2019, the Brazil for a while had four major airlines and one of them, Avianca Brazil, collapsed and they went from four to three and all the other well, the remaining three saw their earnings, you know, jump sharply. I mean, Azul for one had a, you know, really, really strong 2019. And then that, of course, you know, disappeared for a while during the pandemic. And and they, you know, would like, like to see consolidation kind of work some magic again, if not through an airline collapsing, then perhaps through, through another merger. And as you mentioned, you know, we do have that goal Avianca deal. And uh, who knows, perhaps there'll be some others. But you alluded to this as well. Um, the fact South America is, is interesting in that, or Latin America even more broadly, is interesting in that the international market is just so small. I mean, if you take two, you know, two of the region's biggest cities, let's say like Bogota and Sao Paulo, there's just not a lot going on between those two cities. I mean, the that is schedules. actually a good point. Like there are yeah. I, three or four flights a day on that route. Two right, major right. South American capital, like not capitals, but two major South American economic centers. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's strange. And I think part of that, it just has to do with, you know, a little bit of history and also geography and, and um, just, uh, I mean, the fact, I always like to see the South American continent. I kind of picture it as I call it the hollow continent. It's got a lot of uh, people living sort of along the edges, along the coast. Right. But then the interior is pretty much, it's, it's just a lot of jungle. you got the Amazon and it's a lot of mountains. You've got the Andes. And so they're just over time, there just hasn't been a lot of, uh, you know, um, a lot of trade uh, in, within, you know, the interior of South America because of those geographic obstacles. And so there's not a lot of, yeah, I mean, when you don't have trade between two cities, you're not going to have a lot of air service. So it tends to be concentrated domestically, which is why, you know, Azul was interested in a merger, you know, within Brazil. Um, right. The the goal of Avianca one, I mean, is that really going to create a whole lot of value? I well, I so I mean, Adrian New uh, Adrian Newhouse at Avianca and Celso Fair at Goal are both, uh, you know, optimistic about that deal creating value. Uh, a lot that, but what they're looking at is, you know, they emphasize the airlines will continue to operate independently. And the example they mm -hmm. used was International Airlines Group in Europe, as we have, and you know. Newhauser was telling me that it, they will be able to coordinate on, say, like you mentioned, the Bogota Sao Paulo route, and that means if Goal and Avianca each have one flight a day, now eventually there's hope that that will grow, but no longer will they operate those two flights, say, between 10 and a.m. and noon. They could put a 10 a.m. flight and then a 5 p.m. flight, so they could have a bit more, uh, you know, options for travelers throughout the day, even if they're doing the same number of frequencies. That is the idea. And then, of course, there's a lot of upsides. You know, they're bidding on the, the cost benefits by being in a single group. They'll be able to jointly procure parts and order aircraft and all those other things. But yeah, and, it's, and I, I I'm sorry, Nate, go ahead. No, I just want to say it's, it's interesting because there's a lot of emphasis on the synergies, the cost synergies of the deal. But they talked less about the commercial benefits, uh, the how much they would grow under the deal. It's it's almost like they're, they're kind of seeing, like there was a lot, let me best step back. There was a lot of talk about cost savings in Latin America and how the crisis sort of pushed the need for cost savings. 
And that's really what they seem to be focused on with the Aubrey deal. Now, when I asked, they definitely said, yes, commercial benefits are, are a part of it, but uh, the their prepared statements were all about costs. Yeah, I, I should probably, the, the other thing I think worth mentioning, the loyalty program synergies could be meaningful as well. Um, oh, that's absolutely. A big, yeah, those are, and they may have mentioned, you know, that to you when you, when you spoke with, with some of the executives down there, but they, they, that is um, a very important contributor to earnings for a lot of these Latin American airlines. I mean, Azul, we talked about them before. Um, they've got kind of three businesses that they call both high margin and fast growing. And it's the loyalty program. It's the cargo business. They also have a kind of a tour operator leisure business. So uh, that could play a role in the, you know, the Abra merger as well. Right. And if you think about it, uh, a goal, I think, of Smiles, which they just bought, um, they bought back a little while ago. But it's, mm -hmm. you know, you bring the Smiles program, the Avianca's uh, loyalty program together, you've got a real pan South American uh, program to compete with LATEM Pass, which is LATEM's loyalty program. And that's got some definite upsides. And I have to say, as we saw it would, during it the would crisis, be enough, it would be enough to make the uh, the investors smile. I would say. <laughs> Good. Sorry, pun there. That, Good that was pun in, there. that was an inappropriately bad humor. Sorry, <laughs> let's move on. It was. It was. <laughs> but so that's a story out of South America. Now let's take a quick break, Jay, and we'll be right back to talk a bit about what's what's happening in North America. All right, welcome back. Before Jay and I talk about earnings at American and United, uh, I'd like to invite our listeners to immerse themselves in the wide world of airlines at our upcoming Skipped Aviation Forum on November 16th in Dallas-Fort Worth, Texas. Please visit airlineweekly.com to learn more, and you can use the code AWPODCAST, that's A-W-P-O-D-C-A-S-T, to get $100 off your ticket. Now, Jay, you got a chance to listen to United's earnings this week. How did they do in the third quarter? They did very well, actually. And I'm going to throw some numbers uh, at our listeners here. So uh, everybody get ready for uh, to get ready, pay attention. I'm, uh, we're going to do some uh, go through go through the margins of the uh, sort of the big three airlines. So uh, United did lead the way of the big three, meaning American, Delta and United. United for the third quarter had 11.5 operating margin. Deltas was 10.7, so kind of you know within within a uh, within distance there, and then uh, American was only 7.2, so they uh, you know are considerably uh, earning considerably less in margin terms than than Delta or United. Uh, yeah, so speaking about United specifically, um, they uh, had um, just looking for some more numbers here. Yeah, so so. United uh, saw, like Delta, just tremendous, and American for that matter, um, just tremendous revenue and demand strength. There's, uh, you know, and it's pretty much across the board. I mean, you know, pockets that are still recovering, whether it be, you know, Northeast Asia and whatnot. But uh, from what I understand, you know, California's maybe a little weak, San Francisco hub, a lot of, you know, tech companies haven't started traveling again. So there, there's, it's not universally good, but but in general, it's just a very, very strong story on the revenue side. Now, what is interesting, and, and I should say, you know, the costs have also gone up a lot. In fact, if you look at, you know, unit revenues versus unit costs, comparing them to 2019, unit costs are up a little bit more than unit revenues. So margins are not quite back to where they were. And that's, again, true for all three of those airlines we mentioned, um, CASM up more than RASM. Uh, However, the um, one interesting aspect going back to demand that United really called out, they said that uh, the sort of the nature of leisure demand has sort of changed, uh, you know, sy systemically, that it's, you know, structurally different now. And they introduced this whole day idea about how, and it's nothing new, you've all heard it before, but how, you know, hybrid work is allowing people to, uh, you know, just to give a quote here from Andrew Nocella, the chief commercial officer, hybrid work gives customers the freedom and flexibility to travel for leisure more often. So uh, United is making the argument that, okay, look, uh, this, you know, this is structurally changed. So even if there is a recession, um, you know, this, 
this kind of helpful boost is going to offset that or help offset that. Um, you know, it remains to be seen uh, how true that actually will be. Um, but that's, you know, that's kind of the thesis that they're running with. And at the same time, they also kind of point out that the industry supply is going to be constrained for a long time because of, as we've talked about before, you know, insufficient aircraft, Boeing and Airbus are not delivering um, as many aircraft as, as the airlines need. Uh, there are labor shortages, there's air traffic control shortages. So they think, you know, combined, put the, all of that together, it's, uh, you know, a, a healthy outlook for United. Um, and in fact, they did give an estimate for their fourth quarter operating margin. And um, looks like it's going to be a, another excellent quarter, you know, 10%, which is great for what's usually a pretty offbeat quarter, Q4. Um, and that would actually, if they do manage 10%, that would actually be higher than the 9% they earned in Q4 of 2019. So wow. it's a uh, that's, pretty that's bullish impressive. story. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it is. It is. So that's interesting. You mentioned, I mean, everything you said about United, I could basically repeat for American. They similarly similarly talked about the the sort of shift in travel patterns and how that's been enduring through the fall which and, and into the winter which is seasonally a weaker period um you know one of the things that american said is they see strong demand continuing unabated into 2023 they were they sort of echoed delta a bastion of delta say you know they didn't go as far as they counter cyclical but Unabated. Did did United also say they they see this demand continuing into the new year? Yeah, I don't know that they specifically gave any kind of guidance on 2023, but that was certainly the sense. Um, I think the you know kind of the unspoken <laughs> message was that yeah, this there's there's don't uh, don't be anticipating any kind of slowdown anytime soon. This is this thing is this this demand recovery has legs. For sure. And what airlines are really, I mean, they're going to benefit from as long as demand continues is these capacity constraints. You mentioned aircraft deliveries, uh, and then there's also the regional pilot or the pilot shortage, which is affecting regional airlines. Those were two things that American highlighted when they talked about 2023. You know, Americans going to fly 95 to 100 percent of what they flew in 2019. And they they were they were asked and said, yes, they would like to fly at least a few more points than that next year, but they can't simply because uh, they specifically said Boeing uh, max deliveries are down. They'll take about eight fewer than they had planned. And, you know, they are not able to fly as much regionally because, oh, and this was interesting, not just a pilot shortage, but now the issue is they need to upgrade first officers to captains at their regional affiliates. But to do that requires a certain number of hours and training, and they don't think that's going to ease for two to three years. That's 2025. So there are definitely going to be a lot of constraints that could be very rousing positive in 2023 for airlines if demand holds. Right. I mean, I, I, I buy all that. United also uh, says that, uh, that, and I'll say one thing that thing that's interesting. And I, um, when I listen to the American call, I have a better idea of this. Maybe you have, uh, maybe you can um, give me some, pers- if anything, that American said. You might want to add here, but uh, it seems to be that United and American are both taking kind of polar opposite approaches on their uh, on their networks. In terms of United, it seems to be very bullish about international. American seems to be going more the way of hey, let's focus on domestic, and uh, that Absolutely. could be you know yeah, does that, does that sound about right? Absolutely. Uh, Vasu Raja, the commercial chief at American, said that they are going to be they are they're about 80 percent short haul, a 20 percent long haul in their schedule right now, which is a 10 10 point shift since 2019 uh, towards short haul. And they don't expect that percentage to change much, even as they recover international, because. You know, what they're doing, and, and he was clear about this, is they're doing more flying into their partner hubs. And so that's Heathrow, Tokyo. He mentioned, you know, deep South America and letting their partners pick up the pick up the rest. So American is is I wouldn't say there's, there's I wrote about this in September. They're not giving up on international, but they're definitely not uh, following United and uh, and Delta to a lesser degree and, and trying places like. Majorca and Tenerife and Amman to to offer new flights. So it's it's very interesting. They're definitely taking a different track on that. 
Yeah, it seems to be a little bit less ambitious these days. Now, now American has, has always been since you know, there since the U.S. Airways merger, which has been almost ten years now, hard to believe, but I know. they've always kind of been the more domestic airline, like a larger percentage of their ASM capacity is concentrated in the domestic market, you know, versus Delta and United. Um, and so, you know, potentially, if if they can squeeze more profits out of domestic, they'll, you know, that's that's they'll see it in their margins because it's such a, you know, an outsized portion of their overall network. Um, so yeah, that's uh, and then they do have you know they do have a lot of potential domestic. I mean Dallas DFW is just a super hub for them, and Charlotte is fantastic. And whereas you know it's been a little bit tougher on the on the coastal hubs for them, um, which you know to some extent is true for Delta and United as well. Right. Uh, but we but, I had, yeah, we had Raymond James and Alasavi Scythe right a few weeks ago that because Delta United have have more coastal hubs and and more of that international they have more upside on the earnings side just because that's where travel has recovered the slowest. So, uh, you know, to look at it in terms of American, American has benefited a lot because domestic travel has come back strong and more, like you said, more of Americans ASMs are in the U S domestic market and that's really lifted them. But now with, with the recovery shifting to some of these, to New York, to San Francisco, as travel comes back there, that, that really stands to, to give, United and Delta more of an upside as we go into the new year. Of course, I mean, asterisk being demand continues unabated, corporates come back, the economy doesn't slow things down, but that's, uh, it, it definitely fits that narrative. Yeah. And stepping back for a minute, um, just to uh, look at the capacity, the total capacity for these three airlines versus 2019. Um, and we're talking third quarter here. United and American were still down 10%. So they're 10% smaller in ASM terms than they were in the summer of 2019. Delta was 17% smaller. So they're, um, you know, none of these, uh, any, they're all not quite back to where, where they where they were yet. Um, right. And it sounds like it really might be, close. it might be a little, it might not be 20, it may, might be a 2024 story if that capacity fully comes back. Though 2023 yeah, it, sounds like it's going to be very close. Right, right. And uh, yeah, a lot will just depend. Uh, well, some will depend on demand, some will depend on, you know, aircraft constraints and all the, all the other stuff we've been talking about. I have to add, before we go, I have to add one more. Uh, <laughs> the highlight of the United call was certainly when uh, CEO Scott Kirby was asked about the future of the ultra low cost business model. And he, uh, this is not my words, this is his, he called it a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> and he, wow. he said, yeah, 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 that's, uh, he said it was uh, predicated on basically three things, um, you know, that they, these, in order for an airline, like, you know, he didn't mean names, but Spirit, Allegiant, whoever, Frontier, um, that it's all predicated on rapid capacity growth, which is, you know, becoming harder with all these constraints we're talking about, uh, packing people into planes. And just throwing all these, you know, add-on fees. And he said, it's not nickel and diming people. It's, you know, hundred dollaring people, 150. So it's, um, he, he called it, and here's, here's another quote. Uh, I think that's a doomed business model. <laughs> we'll, uh, <laughs> well, we'll see if uh, Spirit or uh, Frontier or Allegiant or perhaps even Sun Country have anything to, you know, and any responses to that when they report their earnings. We will. We will. Well, we'll, we're going to leave that there. Jay, it's always a pleasure. Uh, Listeners, if you want to reach myself, you can reach me at er at skift.com. You can reach Jay at js at skift.com. Jay, always a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ned. And thanks to all our listeners. And uh, looking forward to the next time. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of the Airline Weekly Lounge podcast. Check out AirlineWeekly.com for a new issue every Monday and updates on the latest airline news throughout the week.